We're here to talk about licensure and, and, and billing out of my wheelhouse, because of course I'm originally from the UK. Um, so Nicole, I don't know if you kind of want to start us off on, you know, what are the main sort of misconceptions and benefits of licensure for a holistic nutrition professional? Absolutely. And um, yeah, it's different from country to country, right? Things are very, very different here than they are in Canada, the UK, any other country. Um, and so, you know, I want to say that NANP, we get a lot of questions from people who have a client, maybe this happened, this certainly happened to me when I was in private practice, I would have client potential clients call me or clients who would come to see me and they would ask me, Hey, can, can you bill my insurance? Right. And so, um, and, and so we get a lot of questions from our members and people who are interested in coming into the industry, asking the question of, you know, can I, can I bill insurance for the services that I'm providing? And there are a lot of misconceptions around being able to bill insurance. So first, of, first and foremost, in order to be able to bill insurance for the services that you're providing, nutrition services, you have to have a license. The insurance companies are bound by regulation um, to uh, only work with licensed practitioners. And so there's that whole thing, and we're, we're going to talk a little bit about that. But I think the biggest misconception is um, I, if I bill insurance, I send them my bill, I send them what I normally charge, and the insurance sends me a check for that amount of money. And that is not the case. <laughs> so does it vary from insurance company to insurance company? So yeah. I might uh, have a client with one insurance company and they tell me, oh, 45 minutes. And then I get another client and I assume I've got 45 minutes, but this insurance company says 30 minutes. Not yeah. only um, will it vary from insurance company to insurance company, but it varies within insurance companies based on the the member or your client's benefit plan. Huh. So every benefit plan is different. And some health plans, one of the health plans that I worked for, we had literally hundreds of different benefit plans. So this client may be able to get uh, one visit per year with a nutrition professional, while this client, maybe they work for an employer who has bigger bargaining power, um, maybe this client can get 10 visits with a nutrition professional. It really depends on the benefit plan. And the onus is on you as the practitioner to contact the health plan and find out what the benefit plan will allow for. Oh, gosh. Okay. So quite a lot of admin on our part before we can even really engage and kind of map out anything with a client or set any expectations. Okay. Absolutely. And I would highly recommend that if mm -hmm. you're interested in accepting insurance dollars and this is the direction that you want to go, you need to be proactive because you don't want to spend time working with a client and then not get paid at all. And the reimbursement isn't great. And we'll talk about that in a minute, but uh, you don't want to not get paid at all. That's for sure. Okay, no, that's good. Um, and I think we kind of covered, yeah, so the main drawbacks really are the, probably the admin side of it, because of course, we already spend quite a lot of time on the back end outside of our consultations, you know, researching, putting the plan and supplement things together. So that's a, clearly a drawback is it increases our admin time. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, okay. That is, that is a fair and almost an understatement. Okay. Um, and I'm just being very honest here. The amount of work that goes into, first of all, pursuing a license, which we'll talk about, um, then you have to figure out which insurance companies you want to work with, and you have to go through their credentialing process. On average, that takes about six months, and there's a lot of back and forth. You have to submit a lot of different kinds of paperwork, back and forth, back and forth. Sometimes they lose it if they're accepting new providers, because that's the caveat, not all of them are accepting new providers, right? And so if they are, you have to go through their credentialing process. Once you get through the credentialing process, you have to learn how to bill insurance. Now here in the States, we have um, IC, what's called ICD-10 codes. Those are diagnostic codes that have to be on the 
the claim bill, the bill that will go to the insurance company. But then you also have to learn other coding systems like CPT codes. CPT mm -hmm. codes are the codes that you use to tell the insurance company what you did while you were with the client. Mm -hmm. And so you have to have a really good understanding of those types of codings and how to code something to get it to go through. Then let's say you submit a bill. Um, it may not get paid the first time. Um, you have to then go back to the insurance company and find out why. There's a lot of back and forth. Um, a lot of insurance companies um, will kick a claim out immediately um, for other health insurance reasons. You know, maybe they think there's another health insurance plan involved. Um, they have all kinds of different reasons why they can kick a claim out and not pay it. Um, and then you, as the practitioner, have to go back to the insurance company and try and figure out why they didn't pay that claim and then resubmit it in a way that you think will get paid. They can't tell you how to bill, okay? That's another little dirty little secret. <laughs> People used to ask me all the time. I worked my, initially when I got into the industry, I worked in a call center and I was talking with practitioners who were following up on their claims. And they would say, well, how should I bill it then? And it was like, no, I, I'm not allowed to tell you how to bill. Um, so you're really on your own. You're kind of out there on your own. Okay. So that's pretty, that's a, that's a drawback. In, it almost like, you know, you're learning another thing system, right? Cause you just mentioned all these codes and things. So, okay. So definitely an increase in, in, in admin. And of course it sounds like maybe this is ideal if you do have a team and a, a separate administrator who can be on top of this all the time, yeah. because it's going to slow down the whole pipeline of your, of your workload and your business. Okay. Um, and I think, yeah, maybe we've kind of already addressed this, but how does working insurance can companies constrain the services that we offer? And like you've just said, it sounds like, yeah, we're going to be limited. I mean, we're already relatively time poor because most of us are solo practitioners, right? We're doing, we're wearing all the hats. Yeah. Um, and so this can become almost, uh, like an extra cost to us because it's our time. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. So, so really, when it comes to the constraints, there's really two main constraints, honestly. Mm -hmm. One is, um, you know, the insurance company will limit uh, um, what types of benefits are available. But then there's, as I mentioned earlier, limitations based on the benefit plan. So it's kind of a twofold um, limitation that will be uh, imposed by the insurance company. Okay. And then how do insurance reimbursement rates compare to like private pay rates for a, a nutrition consultation? Okay. Um, if I'm charging $250, do I get reimbursed that or a portion of that? Does the, yeah, I, I'm not quite, that's something I'm not clear on. I don't know if I have to make concessions or the client pays a little and the insurance pays a little and how does that yeah. all work? Yeah. So uh, it's important for everyone to, to understand that once you get through the credentialing process, if the insurance plan is, insurance company is accepting new providers, then you have to sign a contract. And the contract, and this is the work that I did, the contract is a boilerplate contract that every other practitioner in your space is going to get. And the idea is that you're signing a contract for a discounted rate mm -hmm. in exchange for a potentially higher volume of clients. And I say potentially because you could sign a contract and you could literally never see a single client. So you may have gone through all of that work and you never, ever see anyone. Um, the, a part of the contract is what's referred to as a fee schedule. It is non-negotiable. It is what it is. In particular, individual practitioner contracts are not up for negotiation. I did this work for many, many years. The only contracts that were up for negotiation were with uh, uh, big hospital systems, um, fee-for-service hospitals, meaning that they weren't part of a capitated system, which is a whole other conversation. Um, but the individual onesie twosie practitioner like who who we are and what we represent in the industry you get what you get and 
um, I will tell you that it is a small percentage of what your bill charges are. And so we've done a little bit of research and we understand that we're looking at about, and, and this is an approximation because it's based on your region and where you're physically located, that um, you're on average going to get 50% or less of what we understand our normal bill charges in our industry. So when you look at the amount of reimbursement that you're going to get months later, right? Because they don't pay their claims right away versus having a private pay client in front of you who pays you at the point of service. It's a huge difference between what you're getting reimbursed and when you're getting reimbursed. But then when you add in all of the administrative tasks that you have to undertake in order to get that 50 cents to the dollar, then you really have to ask yourself, is this an endeavor that I want to undertake? And let's be honest, insurance companies are for-profit, publicly traded corporations beholden to their shareholders to show a profit. That is their job. How do they show a profit? Okay, so they limit the time that you spend with your client. They determine the types of services that you can provide. They limit the number of sessions that are allowed. They um, dictate your reimbursement rate, that discounted fee, the fee schedule, and then they delay claim payment. That's how they make their money, okay? That's just the reality of it. Um, and so I think that anyone looking at accepting insurance really has to go in with their eyes wide open have an understanding of what you're about to undertake and be cognizant of the challenges that you will undoubtedly face without question. So what are the key benefits then if you're pursuing board certification over licensure? Absolutely. I see this day after day after day. Um, this question comes up so often, but what I really want to address because there's a tremendous amount of confusion about what is licensure? This is a question I receive so often. And, you know, what is meant by licensure? But really what licensure is, is a means by which the state determines what a practitioner can do. So it, it tells those who are licensed what their services can be. We as holistic nutrition professionals don't fall under that category. So we can be a little more innovative and creative. But what we are seeing now is the detrimental side of licensure and how that impacts the communities of our legislators. So several states have rescinded or revised their licensure laws. And as you know, we're talking about insurance being different from country to country let's remember that state laws are different. So now we have 50 plus different types of licensure laws restricting how we as holistic nutrition professionals can work if we are indeed licensed. So, you know, what what's effective about that? Um, so what we want to do is the states are starting to look at things like BCHN credentials, accreditation, they're finding that quality and competence isn't necessarily going hand in hand with licensure laws. So this is where we're seeing a push for change. And this is where we as holistic nutrition professionals are able to shine with our credential BCHN. Yeah. Okay. And that's super important because I know, of course, you take care of all our legislation. You're constantly updating the map when I'm always referring people to go and check out because I know things change on a, on a regular basis. Uh, okay. So how does the flexibility then of not being tied to insurance regulations benefit both clients and practitioners? It does benefit both clients and practitioners. Um, you know, Nicole was talking about how limited we are if we are accepting insurance from the insurance company. Um, many limit the time that you can work with your client. I know that I can't do an appropriate intake in 15 minutes 
But that, I know, that is indeed what you can be paid for by many insurance companies. If you're working with what they call a group, you may be able to be reimbursed for 30 minutes, but that's the limit. And I think we've all seen this. If we've gone to, you know, a primary care physician, they're, they're looking at the clock saying, oh, my 10 minutes is up. Here's your prescription. Got to go. So we don't work like that. We really want to be able to help our clients to provide solid recommendations and to meet them where they are. And, you know, being able to have that benefit of time um, and time equals money. So we yeah. can do them appropriately. Yeah, I know a big part for me, of course, is building that know, like, and trust. And I want to get to know my client as well as I want them to know me and, and how I work. So, yeah, yeah, that could be definitely not a lot would be happening. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And, you know, when we, when we look at our federally trademarked BCHN and we start looking at fees, um, you know, when we're talking about becoming licensed, we're talking about a tremendous amount of work, which can radically prevent people from going into the industry. Um, you know, you've got supervised hours to be licensed. So you've got to give 1000 hours of your time without pay. If you can get accepted into the program. Oh, the wow. Seats are extremely limited for those individuals who are seeking licensure state by state. So you may not be able to get into the program um, there are fees associated with the exams. There are fees associated with submitting the licensure documentation. Um, there are fees uh, with the renewals of documentation, which expire at varying times depending on the state in which you're licensed. So one of the one of the benefits that we have for professional members is the career preparedness program which is an incredible resource if you're just starting your practice. Um, it gives you step-by-step -step guides in how to establish yourself and the legalities of getting your, your LLC or your C Corp started. Um, it points back to our state laws, which as you mentioned, Andrea, are always changing. So this is a living, breathing document that's there for our professional members and it has been very beneficial. Yeah. And it's free. It's and it's free, free for our professional members. We want you to be successful. So we, um, we're providing it for free. Um, and I just, I just want to chime in here that Laura is 100% spot on. Um, the Career Preparedness Program was developed with our members in mind. Um, and it's, she has provided so many rich tools um, that are in that in that program. You can hop, skip, and jump around. You don't have to take it like a course. If there's mm -hmm. something you need, for example, just earlier this week, I had a member reach out to me directly and ask me about setting up an NPI number, um, a national national practitioner identification number, right? Is that what it stands for, Laura? NPI. And I said, hey, you have free access to that information. Just go in to the career preparedness program and look at the lessons. You'll see it right there. Um, it's a multi-page document that walks you through all the steps. So it's a great resource. Mm. Um, so to summarize, it sounds like it's fair to say, you know, that private pay allows for more personalized client care. Um, there are huge considerations to be made here in terms of, you know, the administration. Uh, you mentioned an exam, right? Maybe people don't realize they've got to do all, all of that, right? Um, and I think if I'm understanding correctly as well, there is the potential, depending on what state you're in, that you may not even get into your program. So you could go through all this or at least start the application route and everything. And you don't even get into the program because there are already many people in the area already fulfilling those spots. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. It can be devastating. I mean, you work so hard for your education and then you find out, well, I, I can't move forward yeah. uh, until I have my thousand hours. And, you know, if you're going the BCHN route, you only have to have 500 hours, but you can be paid for those hands-on hours as you're working with clients. Um, and the other, the other piece of that is when you're credentialed as a BCHN, we try to keep those costs down. 
We really, mm. we want to make it beneficial for our BCHN practitioners to, to recredential, to stay on top of things. And that's why we have so many educational offerings and keep the fees as low as we possibly can. Right. Yeah. Now that's good. I think that gives everyone a comprehensive overview, including myself. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think this is fantastic. So um, yeah, thank you, ladies. I'll say thank bye. You. Yeah, great conversation. Thank you, ladies. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Laura. Bye. 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 bye.